Thanks for visiting the Refuge Church YouTube channel. We're glad you tuned in and we pray that you're blessed by the message. We join the service already in progress. We've been, uh, we've been going through the letters that Paul wrote when he was in prison. You know, the prison epistles, prison letters. And you end up with um, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. And we're coming up to Philippians now. And as we were going... You know, I was studying through this. Um, before we even get started, I got to give you kind of a kind of an observation, kind of a, a you know, God with a two by four. I I'm I'm reading this and I'm looking at this stuff, and I'm thinking to myself, we, in our regular day, you know, day every day, we see what's going on out there in the world. Earthquakes, of seven point something, uh, wars, that are just. Uh, incredible, horrible things. Um, even the even the peace, general just loss of peace in the world, even just here in the United States, we see all that kind of stuff going on out there, and yet we're in here going over things like we had the past couple of weeks. Love. How does God want us to live? That kind of thing. And it almost seemed like 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 it's uh, where we focused. And the one thing about refuge, far beyond anything else, is that we always want to make sure that what we're doing in God's Word is relevant. We don't just go uh, uh, grab a section of Scripture and we just go, well, that's good enough. Let's just, you know, let's just go with that. Everything needs to be applicable. Everything needs to be something that we can apply and change. So I'm looking at this and, I, and I'm kind of going, God, you've been taking us down this road. We're talking about love. We're talking about, but yet all this stuff, it's just... I mean, it's almost as though we're, we're really concerned with what color the wall's being painted on the Titanic. You know, Lord, show me what we're, show me what we're talking about here. So he, as always, he shows me Matthew 24, 3. And it says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, like we're hearing. See that you're not troubled. For these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. You understand what he's saying? Those are non-signs. When you see people that are running around all over the place and they're saying the earthquakes and famines and look at this and oh my gosh, oh my God. Really what he's saying there is that these are non-signs. Yeah, you're going to see these things, but the end is not yet. Verse 7, for nation will rise against nation. We're seeing it. Kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines. We're seeing it. Pestilence and earthquakes in various places. We've just seen it. Nepal, right? All of these things are the beginnings of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation, and kill you. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Okay, great. Lord, you just proved my point. We're in here worried about something when the world is just, come on, we're, let's, Lord, we need to just, so he takes me to the next one. Ten. And then many will be offended and will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Lawlessness, illegality. See, it's the violation of the law. That's what that word means. Breaking God's natural laws. Lawlessness. Yes. Homosexuality, okay, you guys get it. God's laws. Also breaking man's laws. Just in general, chaos. We were seeing, uh, the men were seeing in Acts 19, when they went into Ephesus and they were preaching the gospel and they started to cause them a shortage of money because these statues were not being sold anymore. So they went in and just made a scene and they said confusion was in the group. Chaos. This is what we're seeing again. Chaos is ensuing right here. We're, and they just want to break man's laws. All over. It doesn't make any difference if we're talking about uh, Baltimore, Fergus. It doesn't make any difference. And everybody is trying to get us to start focusing on a specific point that will solve this. 
Oh, well, it's a race thing. Oh, well, it's an economy thing. It's a, you know what it is? It's a lawlessness thing. That's what it is. And the enemy likes to send us out on distractions. So in general, what we're seeing here is just people living in unrighteousness. That's what we're seeing. That's what it is. And the love. Now you want to say, oh, yeah, well, the world's falling apart. I'm going to pop your bubble. See love at the end? That's agape. So, who, does the world have God's love? No. So who's that talking about? Raise your hand, church. It's you. Right? Love of many will grow cold. See, God is saying, yeah, these things have begun. Absolutely. And I am directing you to victory here. The next verse, 13. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. He who endures to the end will be saved. We're not talking about salvation. We know that salvation comes with belief. So if we've got belief, we've got God's love. So what's he talking about? Whoever endures to the end, the salvation of the mind, the salvation of the victory of not being caught up in that stuff. See? What we see here is that the timeline that God has is in play. Don't be shocked. Don't be shocked. If you think about this, look at some of the things that's happened in history. What about Noah? As bad as things were, as terrible as things were, as horrible as things were, do you think he went, what? We're building an ark now. Now's the time? What are we doing? Well, that's what we're doing now. What are, what are we doing? It's crazy. What, what do you mean it's in play? Peace is leaving the earth. Don't be shocked. It is. That's why you see road rage. That's why you see all the other craziness that goes on in your lives on a daily basis. You say something crosswise to somebody else, and right away, their first response, knee-jerk reaction is, what would you say? Because that's the spirit that is all over everybody right now. So <clears throat> when you see this, God is saying, all of that stuff is in play, but the peace of my people, the peace of my people who have agape, the peace of my people is not based on the things of the earth, is it? It's not. You get happy and you get peace because you got a promotion at, at your job? Okay, will you be unhappy and freak out when you lose the job? You get happy because you're getting along with this person. Will you freak out when you're not? Our peace is not attached to the things that are in this world. Our peace is attached to one place. Amen? Just one. There are many things in our lives that can cause an offense. This is why God showed me this. There's many things that can cause an offense. They can cause a believer to betray and hate one another. And because of the lawlessness and the sin that we see so quickly increasing around us, our love could grow cold. And I'm not talking about the unsaved out there. I'm talking about us. Our love could grow cold. But if we endure to the end, our sanctification, the renewing of the mind, will be preserved. So how do we endure? That's the question. I get it, because I, I can paint your beautiful picture of how things are disintegrating. Fine, show me how to undo that, how to take this thing apart. This is what God has been showing us throughout the example in Paul's life. This is why we've been kind of going through this. Paul, in chains is unjustly locked up. Do you remember why he was picked up? It was like witness protection. You go back and read it in Acts, he did not get picked up because he was the violator. He got picked up because they were about ready to kill him. So they grabbed him, pulled him aside, and kept him in protective custody, and that continued all the way till Rome. And Rome doesn't mess around. When you're locked up, you're not going to get some kind of a slick lawyer to go in there and pull them out. They just lopped off heads. Rome did not mess around. So <clears throat> you see him locked up in that situation, and still he's concerned with other believers. He's, still, he's locked up over there unjustly, did not slow him down a bit. He's still concerned with, hey, what's going on with the Ephesians? 
What's going on with the Colossians? What's going on? And now we're seeing that he's concerned. What about those ones back in Philippi when I was there? What about that? What about those ones? Are they okay? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. As we enter into this, take this message that you've got for us. Make it understandable. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Be the teacher. Be the counselor. Break it down to the level and understanding that each one of us is on so that we can grasp this and grow. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi and with the bishops and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In spite of the difficult circumstances, as a prisoner, Paul was rejoicing. This is nuts. He doesn't have cable TV and a workout yard and all the other things that you might see today in our prison system. This guy is in a stone room chained to a guard who will cut his throat if he messes with him. And yet with all of that, he's rejoicing. And the secret of Paul's joy here is that he has a single mind. He has a single mind about things. See, people do what is important to them. I don't think we need too much of a description for that. People will talk about what is important to them. The things that they do and talk about the most are the things that are important to them. You walk over and start talking to folks and you hear about the new this and the new that and this and that and what they're doing and all these, that's what's important to them. That's what they're important. You're seeing that uh, come out of them. Paul lived and talked about Christ. Paul lived and talked about the gospel. In this first chapter, Christ is named 18 times. And the gospel is mentioned six times. These were the things that Paul is single-minded about. This is how his joy was there. So what does it really mean, right? Single mind. We read that a lot of different places. What does it say with single mind? It's the attitude that says, it's not about me. Single mind. As long as as Jesus is lifted up, as long as the gospel is preached, that's all I care about. It's not about me. Preach the gospel. Share love. Because if that's what we do, it's good. It's not about me. Paul later on says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He realized everything that's about this physical world is going to pass away. The thing that you get upset about, the thing that you, oh my gosh, I can't believe that's going to happen. It's not too much longer before it won't matter. Where does it say in Peter, the, uh, the first earth and the, or the first heaven, the first earth passed away? Ain't nothing going to be here. So we get so wound up about it because it becomes kind of a distraction. That's why Paul said, for me to live is Christ. But to die is gain. Now, one of the facets that we see, um, the, the enemy's strategy, right, against man is to break that single-mindedness. That's what he's got to do because it is so simple. It is so absolutely simple. The, God is putting a call on the church to be the salt, to be the light. See, there is no solution in Baltimore that involves politics. There is no solution in Ferguson that involves a penal system. There is no solution that involves the media. The only solution to these kinds of things is Jesus Christ. And it's very, very, very simple. Love. Walk this through. Are there earthquakes out there? Yes. We know people, at least three groups of Tekent, that are already in Nepal. But they're saying that there's a clog in Kathmandu where they can't get the resources out to the people who need it. Sewage is broken open. The next thing we're going to start looking for is diseases, dysentery. Things are going to start, and that's the problem. How do we solve that? Politics is what's slowing it down. Right? Systems. Man. What needs to occur? Love. Let's get it done. Be the salt. Be the light. 
If that community, if those believers that were in Detroit right now, if they started standing up and living for Jesus, I don't care what color they are, I don't care what job they've got, they start living for Jesus, that stuff will stop. We have to start understanding that this is what we're called to be. Go be salt. Go be light. We've got things to do. So in that, um, the strategy here is to break that. Because if he can break that, chaos can reign. If he can break that single mind, we're going we're gonna to start falling for a distraction of self-centeredness. I, I, I've said this before. It's getting to the point now where the distraction is not even hidden anymore. It's not even disguised. You know what I mean? As a kid growing up, I remember seeing uh, triple X movie blah, blah, blahs on the places, but they were hidden. They were around the back alley and in the other door, and you, and you didn't see it. You didn't know what it is. Today, it's advertised, and the posters are stuck in the front windows. It's not disguised anymore. And if you don't want to go that far being drastic, then look at the other stuff. What is it, the, what is it that we're doing? iPod. My space. My, my Facebook. It's all about us, isn't it? Everything is being directed towards like this vacuum of self-centeredness. That's the distraction. And the first thing that starts to come up is, I deserve. I deserve. Well, I, it, it's all about, well, that sounds like Isaiah, doesn't it? I, I will, I will, I will. This is what Satan was saying. So, <laughs> these events that we're seeing out here, they are moving so quickly now, we can hardly even catch our breath. We can hardly even, it used to be a month before we heard about ISIS uh, beheading 20 or 30 believers somewhere. It's not. It's daily. Now it's not even daily. Now it's morning and afternoon. This is just increasing and it's moving so quickly. So we need to realize what's happening in our space to be able to see what God is saying for us to take a hold of this and make the difference and make the change. Understand what I'm saying? We See, where we used to say, for example, we used to make a note. I need to, I need to call Chris when I get home to a phone. But now, I can sit here and have a conversation with Janet, and I'll go, oh, wow, right in the middle of her talking to me, I'll whip my phone out, and I'll go, hey, Chris, what's going on? You see how we're disconnecting now? I don't know if you had something important to say or not, but I need to get a hold of Chris. Why do I got to do that right now? It's also turning into, uh, uh, well, how come you didn't call me back? I text you five minutes ago. <laughs> right? Every one of you guys in here, somebody has said that to you in some fashion. I text you. Why, I, even, even in business, well, I emailed that over to you. Do I hover over these technical <laughs> devices waiting for something to happen? But this is where we're at. This is the programming that we're kind of going through. And what we don't realize, uh, it's the frog in the blender. Every one of us has a cell phone in our pockets. So on one hand, we're saying, yes, I agree. But on the other hand, we're being sucked into this. And, and what we've got to do, have a healthy balance. You know, you need a phone. You, okay, I get it. But have a healthy balance. Where are we at? Because if we've got to be salt, we've got to be light, we've got to realize where the distraction now is starting to get a hold of us. See, we can see that this combination of, of technology and our society, just in general, combine that with our pride and our greed and our self-centeredness, we are motivated to try to do so many things and try to get so many things done at one time that we're just spent. You're just absolutely spent. And it makes it difficult when you're like that. It makes you difficult to be single-minded. It makes you very difficult to have that gospel as a foundation for everything that you do because you're so to-do list oriented, got to get it done, got to get it done, got to call this guy, got to text this guy, and, and this is what we do, because we're so busy, we're so moving, we're so fat, you know, this is what we got, and you don't realize that you've gotten off track. You didn't do it on purpose. You didn't say, well, I think I'm going to just start, you know, ignoring God. You didn't do that. You were just walking and got distracted, bright, shiny objects, and then there you went. This is where we're at. And these distractions, they cause us to be not single-minded, double-minded. The opposite of single-minded. James 1.8 says, he is a double-minded man. And then what? Unstable in all of his ways. I hate to say this. 
I'm the guy to point at as an example. Oh, I get a lot done. Oh, ask my wife. I can't sit still. But I almost think that over a period of time, I've been programmed into this. I just, I can't, because I think I've got to keep going instead of just be at peace. Be still and know that I am God. See, we're thinking that we've got to get this done, 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 and God goes, who's doing this? And we start realizing, wow, this is, this is something that we've got to pay attention to. Uh, James 4.8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. That's pretty clear, right? And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Oh, we just went home. Oh, he didn't even mess around, did he? He did not even mess around. Look, people, you call him your God. You say you serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and yet he has to tell you that you need to draw near to him and get away from that stuff, you double-minded, single-minded. Turn off Madison Avenue's advertising and bombardment of the stuff that's going on. Psalm 119, verse 113, one of the greatest chapters in your Bible. Happens to be dead center in your Bible. Talks about the Word of God. By the time we get to verse 113, it says, I hate the double-minded. Wow, that's pretty heavy words. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. You cannot have him as your hiding place and your shield when you're double-minded. Because you're trusting in this, and I'm trusting in this, I'm trusting in the fact I'll get this done, and I'm trusting in all this stuff, I'm trusting in all this, and I'm trusting, instead of just going, peace, be still, I'm trusting in you. You are my hiding place. I know what the world says, but your word says, right? Paul hoped in God's word, and he was single-minded about the circumstances around him. Did it look grim? Sure. At any time, Caesar could have just said, hey, bring that, that Jew up here. Let's talk about this. What is this mess you've been making of this? Well, I didn't do it. Yeah, I really don't care if he didn't do it. Off with his head. That's, that wasn't a stretch. That was a very, very, very real possibility. Didn't bother him. He was single-minded. He was still rejoicing in spite of his circumstances. Those circumstances were almost invigorating him. To rejoice because Paul saw his circumstances strengthened the fellowship of the gospel fellowship the fellowship of the gospel like everything else in the 21st century we have watered this one down to fellowship fellowship <laughs> when we say fellowship we think Hey, how about coming on over to the house for some fellowship? We say, boy, those, the, the girls or the guys, they, they, boy, they really had some fellowship. You know, kind of like an old coin, you know. It was struck and it was sharp and it was crispy when you first got it, but after years of use, all of a sudden the impression's gone. The real meaning of fellowship starts to disappear. The word fellowship here has a very specific intended meaning. And if we make an effort to understand what fellowship really means, the biblical meaning of fellowship, and if we return back to its original meaning, we're going to see success in our relationships. We're going to see success in the things the way God intends them to be. We're going to start seeing the church be the church and not a gathering point for social activities. You see what I'm saying? The church was supposed to walk into a city and turn it upside down. That's what Acts said. It said they were the people of the way. Wouldn't you like to be known like that? When they found out you believed in God, they took a step back. They didn't go over there to challenge you because they knew whatever it was that you believed, it was real. When Jesus stood up in that garden, they said, I, we're here. And he goes, who are you here for? We're here for Jesus. And he said, I am he. And they fell over. See, wouldn't you like to start walking around as a people that follow that king? 
See, when we start walking into places and cities and we don't have the prostitutes and the drugs and the crime and the carjackings and the home invasions, am I listing anything that's not right around us right here? I don't think so. When we walk into a city like that and we turn that city upside down, do you know how many churches, believers there are in this area? Mike Fallon and I sat down and did it to the point to where we understood without getting specifics there's almost as many people that claim to be in churches as there are the, the uh, population of the city. Really? Even if we held the majority, are you going to try to explain to me why that many churches and that many people are in this and we still have that kind of stuff happening? Because we don't understand what fellowship means. See, we think we understand it because, oh, we're going to hang out. See, that's what the modern translation of fellowship... See, we start to get to the point where it's just a hangout. You know, oh, we're going to go hang out. We're going to go hang out and see what's going on. Biblically, the word fellowship simply means this. To have in common. Oh, okay. But true Christian fellowship is really much deeper than just, say, sharing some coffee or sharing the fact that you wear the same cross around your neck or some earrings or the stickers on your car, you know? It's deeper than that kind of something that you've got in common. It means that there is a bond between you and that other person. The modern definition of fellowship is really a lot more like friendship, you know? Uh, there's many kind of relationships that we see that has strong bonds. Think about it. Um, fraternities. How about military men who served in wartime? Right? Right, Vince? They served. And when they serve, they put their life down for that guy right next to them. So there is a bond. There is, no doubt. And I'm not diminishing that kind of a bond. It might even be where there were other things. Maybe you grew up with the friends that were in your neighborhood. Maybe they were gangs. Maybe they were gangs. Maybe that's what it was. And that was the closest you had to a family. And there is a bond to a certain extent with that right there. But the truth is, you cannot actually have biblical fellowship unless you have something that is eternal in common. Oh, we just changed the whole game. When you have something eternal in common, it means that both of you possess eternal life in your heart. That's where we've got to start. See, unless a person has trusted Christ as his Savior, he can't even comprehend the fellowship of the gospel. He can't even comprehend what that means. He's going to try to relate it to one of those other relationships that he's got with somebody. Oh, I understand what that means. Oh, I've got a real strong bond with my fraternity brothers also. I get that you're trying to understand this, but you can't even grasp it because the God of this world has blinded the hearts and minds of those who disbelieve. What the Christian has in a bond with another believer is far beyond, far beyond that even when they have eternal life. Fellowship of the gospel, it's not automatic. It's not automatic. That's the problem. There are people who are born again. There are people who are um, believers. They know Jesus. They believe. And they've been taught that was the finish line. Pray that prayer with the pastor. And as soon as that got done... Put the check mark in the box. We'll send you the membership card in the mail, and that's the end of the story. We're done. Jesus will be back in a little while. You can wait on the bus step with the rest of us. This is what they've been taught, which means how are they going to live their life? Like they've always lived it. Why would they change it? Well, how are they going to hang out with the rest of the church? The way they do with any other group. The way they do with Rotary. The way they do with a knitting circle. The way they do with a college. The way they do with anything else because it's just a group of people that's together. Because if they were taught that it's a choice, things would be different. We were talking about something just recently, and, uh, and Doc brought this up, and it, and it really is phenomenal. It says that he, Jesus, came in the flesh. He put on flesh, and he dwelt among us. I can tell you that if you go through Hosea, if you go through and understand in Ruth, where Jesus had to put on flesh because he could not die on that cross. He could not shed that blood for our sins unless he was a human. Couldn't. Illegal. 
God could not come and do that and go, it's done. It would have been an illegal payment. It would have been like using a stolen credit card because it's illegal. He had to put on flesh. He had to be a human and dwell among us because then he died as one of us, but sinless. That's how salvation comes to us. So you go, okay, great, that's why he put on flesh. But in this conversation we were having, there's another angle to this. Think about this for a second. When he put on flesh, he could have just put on flesh and died, and that was the end of the story. He walked with us. He walked with us. 33 years. He rubbed elbows with us. He cried with us. He laughed with us. So what was he doing? He was fellowshipping with us, wasn't he? God wanted to dwell with man from day one. What does it say about Adam? It says that he came and he visited him, and he talked with him. And then one day he came and he goes, Adam, where are you? Why did he say that? Because that fellowship was broken. That fellowship was broken because of that sin. So some time went by, all of a sudden, Moses is leading those people. And, he's got, and what was the first thing he was instructed to do? If you want a correct thing, when Char Charlton Heston came down out of that mountain, he should have been carrying more than just... Okay, that was for the old people. The young people will get that. There was a movie called The Ten Commandments, and there was Moses, and it was Charlton Heston. It wasn't the NRA guy. It was... Okay. If Moses was depicted correctly, he would have came down with more than just two slabs of stone. He would have came down with two slabs of stone and a rolled up set of blueprints. Because he came down with the information necessary to build the tabernacle. Why? God's everywhere. God's omnipresent. Why does he need that? Because he wanted to dwell with his people. And wherever they went, he went. And that's how it's supposed to be. So when Jesus came down here and put on flesh, what was the idea? The idea was is that he wanted to dwell with us, wanted to interact with us, wanted to be one with us, wanted to fellowship with us. Now, the church, we got a great example of this, right? Here's a perfect example. Acts 2.44. Everybody knows this. I'll read it. Now, all who believed were together. We're talking about the church. All who believed, right? Okay and had all things in common. Oh, we got things in common, all things even. And sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Boy, what a great group. Looks like communism works to a certain extent, right? So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. That's awesome. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Well, that just looks great. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Why is the church in the condition it's in? Why is the book of Acts? Why, did it, why do you see the... Well, look. If they're operating in love, they're operating in fellowship, the end result is real believers start showing up and the church grows and it's powerful. What is the reciprocal? Don't do that. You got what we got today. But by chapter 5 of Acts, we got them lying about how much they're going to give. Ananias and Sapphira, right? Is this the whole amount? Oh, yeah, that's the whole amount. <laughs> well, hey, your spouse was in here just talking about the same thing. Is this the amount? Oh, what did he say? Yeah, okay, great, okay, that's the same amount. Okay, great. Oh, behold the feet of the men that just carried your dead husband out. <laughs> Next. And then by the time we get to chapter 6, the complaining begins. Chapter 6, verse 1, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint, go figure, against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. I'm not getting mine! I, I, iPad, my face, my space, where's my food? So what, what can we see? Even in the best situations. Even in the best situations, especially where God is moving, the enemy is going to attack the mind, where he will go after the selfishness of man. It's the easiest button we have to push. Pride. It's the easiest button we got to push. We are being perfected, I agree. We're not perfect. And he knows it. Paul fights this selfishness. 
by sharing himself with the Philippians. He shares in the fellowship of the Spirit, we're going to see. He even shares the fellowship of his sufferings. Wow, that's not a nice thing to share. Of course it is. Because when we share of ourselves, we are giving of ourselves, right? And what have we just spoken of recently? Love is giving. Love is fellowship. Sharing of ourselves is the defense to what Jesus said was going to happen in Matthew 24. See, sharing of ourselves is the defense for being offended. Sharing of ourselves is the defense for betraying one another, hating one another, and it's the defense for allowing your love to grow cold. Sowing and reaping. What is it that you need? Give it away. I need love. Give it away. Sowing and reaping. The victories as well as the challenges that we all share in Christ is what bonds us together in love. The victories and the challenges that we go through as we share them with one another, that's what creates that bond. This is why God's people thrive spiritually during times of oppression. Look through the seven letters to the churches in Revelation, and you're going to find that there was Ephesus, then there was Smyrna. When the persecuted church Smyrna starts to come up, what happened? Did the church disappear? No. It thrived. Yet when the persecution of the church stopped happening later on, what happened? Church of Laodicea. We're in need of nothing. Persecution causes this to grow. Because the need for each other here drew them in together into oneness. Yes, in, in cases where that, that oppression starts to happen, we bond together. We're more concerned with making sure that everybody's okay. If, if an emergency hit, if an earthquake hit, all the little petty things that happen in our world, they disappear. Because you'd be more concerned with making sure that they were okay. Are they okay? Are the children okay? Does everybody got food? Is the lights on? Do you got a place to see? It, all of a sudden, you put your priorities right because it's emergency. Why does it have to take an emergency to get us there? Paul had three thoughts in this chapter that describe true Christian fellowship. The first one is, a person in true fellowship says this, I have you in my mind. He says to another believer, I have you in my mind. Philippians 1.3. It says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine making a request for you. All with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel. From the first day until now. Be confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. Oh, we like to pull that last one out on its own and use it, verse 6. But if you think about it, he's actually attaching that to the other ones. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day. Then he says being confident. Isn't this where we need to go? Isn't this where? Because the fellowship of the gospel is what triggers this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Isn't it remarkable that Paul was thinking about other people and not of himself? See, as he awaited his trial inside Rome, Paul's mind went back to the believers in Philippi. And every recollection he had brought him joy. And not all of the memories that he had were good. Think about it. Go back to Acts 16 and read it. He was illegally arrested. He was beaten. He was humiliated before the people. Remember that? What's going on here? We don't like what this guy's doing. So they arrest him. They drag him in. But even those memories brought joy because it was through this suffering that a jailer found Christ. Didn't he? And Lydia and her household and the poor slave girl who had been demon-possessed and all of the other Christians in Philippi. And each one of those re recollections came back to him that was joy. Because the joy that he got, it wasn't the persecution, it wasn't the beatings and the stripes, and it wasn't all the stuff that was going on. It was the fact that when he left that place, he had given them Christ. And it was real. And they were growing. How did those people that were in true fellowship with him in Philippi, how did they respond? This is interesting. 
Did you know that the church at Philippi was the only church that entered into fellowship with Paul to help support his ministry? We would say financially, but a lot of times actually just sent whatever goods that were there. Did you know Philippi was the only one that actually entered into that? It's really not a lot different than the gospel today. Bread is bread. Whether it's the guy preaching the gospel or whether it's you sitting at home. Everybody's got to eat. Everybody's got bills. He's out preaching the gospel. The, Philipp the Philippian people are the ones that did that. Paul sent people to Colossians. Remember that? We've been reading this. I sent him back to check on you. I sent, I'm sending this guy to you. I'm sending that to you. And you go, what a good guy, Paul. What a good guy. You know that the Philippians actually sent people to Paul? Paul, we know you're going through it. Paul, we know you're going through it. We're going to send somebody to minister to you. How are we thinking about fellowship? When a person in true fellowship says, I have you not only in my mind, I have you in my heart. Verse 7, just as it is right for me to think of this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you with the affliction of Jesus Christ. See, now we're going to go a little deeper. See, now we're going to go, it's possible to have somebody in your minds without really having them in your heart, doesn't it? This is the superficial stuff. This is the plastic Jesus stuff. Now we're getting real. Now we're going to start getting down in here. And truth be told, some of us are going to have to confess, it's not really my mind and my heart, but you're on my nerves. <laughs> Did I say we're not perfect? Did I say I lead that charge? I'm ahead. Because we need to understand where we're at before we can start making progress. You start pretending that stuff doesn't happen, you're not going to be able to fix anything. First steps, recognizing there's a problem to begin with. But Paul's sincere love for his friends was something that could not be disguised. It was something that could not be hidden. The love of God put in our hearts is that tie that binds us. It's the evidence of salvation, of our very salvation. 1 John 3.14 says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. We know we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. That just went way deeper than love you, brother. Be warmed and filled. Bless you. Bless you. How many times somebody go, oh, hey, how's it going? They don't care about how it's going five minutes. They don't. Be warm and filled. Bless you, brother. But when you read that verse, that, sh that should rattle you to your toes. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. This is the spiritual lubrication that keeps the machinery of the life of a believer running smoothly. Look at the conflicts and bumps that you have in your life and you're going to find they're all tied to this. What is the evidence that Paul's love is for these people? Remember, agape requires us to give something. See, you can run around screaming, oh, love you, love them, love them, love all this, and if there's nothing that you're giving to this, there's no love there. Love requires giving of ourselves. For one thing, Paul suffering and his bonds were proof of his love. Ephesians 3.1 said that he was the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. He wouldn't have been in that situation if he wasn't preaching the gospel for them. And many times we won't even get out of bed to go help anybody or do anything. Time to rattle ourselves up. This guy said, I, I'm here because of that, but he's not crying about it. Because Paul's trial, Christianity was going to get a fair hearing before the officials in Rome. And since Philippi was a Roman colony, the decision would affect the believers there in Philippi. It's more than just that he's preaching the gospel. He's trying to make a stand. Can you think of these, some of these things that we've been talking about, about um, 
for example, uh, same-sex marriage being in, uh, in the um, Supreme Court. You can grab all the signs you want and go stand on every corner and scream and yell and do all that kind of stuff, and how far did it get? But the Holy Spirit is saying to the church, I'm pulling you back. I'm pulling you back away from that kind of stuff because it's like a wave of the sea building up energy and power. And as that riptide starts to go back, what he's saying is, I'm pulling you back into your prayer closets. I'm pulling you back into a situation where you're going to start seeking my face and you're going to start seeing what... And then that way, when you are just in your normal public life, you will shine the light. Not with signs and all this craziness that goes on, but just in your very life, in your very actions, in the very way that you interact with other people. How can we believers have this kind of love and operation in our life? See, a guy told me this week, you know, I get along better with unsaved people in my day to day life than I do with Christians. He's honest. I mean, I know I'm supposed to love them and be patient, but you know what? I've had it. And you think, wow, that's heavy. Christian love is not something that we work up. You know what I'm saying? You can't go to a spiritual gym and lift spiritual weights so that you can, I'm going to, you know. No, it's nothing like that. It's something that God put in us and moves through us. Philippians 1.8 said, for God is my witness, how great I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. With the love of Jesus Christ. See, it's not Paul's love being channeled through Christ, is it? It's not God's love that's doing this. He's saying, man, I am reaching out to you because of what God put in me. It's Christ's love channeling through Paul. Romans 5.5 5 even says that God's love has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The effort on our part really is to do nothing. The effort on our part is really to do nothing. It's merely just not to block God from doing His good work in us. Then we can grow in our love for one another. Don't let your self-centeredness block what God is trying to do inside your life. How can we tell that we're really bound to love other Christians? For one thing, we're concerned about them. Are we concerned about them? The believers in Philippi were concerned about Paul, so they sent Epaphroditus to minister to him. Paul was so concerned about his friends in Philippi that when that guy got sick and he couldn't return immediately home, he was, he was bumming. I know you need to get home. I know you came to help me out, but I want to... I mean, these guys are just trying to outgive one another. Hey, thanks for coming, and I know you need to get back home, but we're worried about you. 1 John 3.18 says, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Don't tell people you love them. Show them. Show them. Another evidence of Christian love is the willingness to forgive one another. Ooh. That's stepping on toes. 1 Peter 4.8 says, And above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. You harbor unforgiveness? You harbor that? It darkens your heart. There was a uh, quizzing thing on a show a while back. It, it was an old show. And the, the guy says, hey, tell us some of the blunders that your wife has made, you know, looking for drama. The guy says, I really can't remember any. Oh, sure you can. Just remember something, you know. Drama, come on, fishing. No, I really can't, says the guy. I love my wife very much, and I just don't remember things like that. Agape records no wrongs. All of the record of wrongs disappear. When you keep trying to dig that stuff up, well, I remember when. I remember. You keep trying to dig that stuff up, there's no forgiveness. That forgiveness needs to let that stuff go. We've all got something that's been heavy, heavy in your life. Somebody somewhere has stomped on you. Agreed. 
Agreed. And keeping it alive in your heart hurts who? Pretty simple. Pretty simple. This is why Christians who practice love always experience joy and peace. You want to start walking around when you're not angry and ticked off at everybody and you're always being judgmental and you always got an attitude and you're always trying to do something? You want to get away from that? You just want to have peace in your life? Start living with that love. Because both of those things are a fruit of the fellowship that we would be having. If you have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, the fruit that comes out is in Galatians 5.22. The fruit that comes out, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. You start walking in that, that'll be the fruit. Your blood pressure will go down. Take the meds and throw them in the trash. The doctor visits can start getting cut back. Well, what have you been doing? Let me tell you what I've been doing. Jesus. That's what I've been doing. I've been fellowshipping with the gospel. The last thing that it is, is if a person is in true fellowship, he will say, I have you in my prayers. Starting at verse 9, And this I pray, your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, and you may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus to the Lord or to the glory and praise of God. God found joy in his memories of his friends in Philippi and his growing love for them. He also found joy in remembering them before the throne of grace in prayer. He had joy holding them up. God, take care of them. Father, you put that person on my heart. Take care of them. Father, I know they're going through some health issues. Send that healing spirit to them. Father, they seem like they were a little short yesterday. I don't know what's causing that, but Lord, take care of them. See, he found joy in holding them up in prayer. Think about this. The high priest in the Old Testament, they had all kinds of stuff that they would wear. One of the things, he had a special garment, and what it was was an ephod, and basically it was kind of a plate. And what it did was it had the 12 stones that represented those 12 tribes. So he wore this thing on there. He carried the people over his heart. When he walked into the Holy of Holies, he wore that. He was taking those people before God. We are the same. We are kings and priests. And if that is our position that we are supposed to be as kings and priests, then... Maybe the deepest fellowship and joy that we can experience in this life is taking others into that throne of grace in prayer. Praying for one another, he says, over and over. Notice that Paul's prayer for these believers here. That their love may abound. Knowledge and all discernment. These are the things he wants them to have. That you may approve the things that are excellent that you may be sincere and without offense. Doesn't it kind of seem like Paul took what Jesus was saying seriously? Because that was Paul's prayer, and what Jesus had said was, then, and then many will be offended. Didn't he just say that they wouldn't be offense? This is what he's praying for. He said they would betray one another and hate one another. See, all these things that Paul's praying is... The opposite of what Jesus was said was going to happen. He's like, okay, I'm taking this seriously. I don't want that to happen to you guys. Christian love is not blind. Agape is not blind. The heart and the mind work together so that we can have discerning love and loving discernment at the same time. Paul wanted his friends to grow in discernment. In, in being able to distinguish light from darkness. 
the ability to distinguish this beyond surface evidence is that mark of maturity. When you're sitting inside of a group and you say, okay, I'm growing, I, I've been a believer and I'm walking this out. The mark of maturity here is how you start to discern things. Think about it like this. A baby learns to speak and it sees a dog run by and all of a sudden he's doggy. Okay, great. Problem is, everything with four legs becomes doggy. The cat is doggy. The horse is doggy. Everybody is doggy. Now later on, we figure out, okay, there are cats and mice and cows and other four-legged things. We start discerning the difference. That's the same thing with us. One sure mark of maturity is discerning love. Paul also prayed that they might have mature Christian character. Sincere and without offense. Man, do we get offended. Man, do we get offended. Well, did you hear that? Did you see that? I can't believe. Or they, did you, they, they didn't say a thing. We get offended over this is the loss of peace that Jesus was sharing. This is why God said, I want you to go back and look at that because, yeah, it's already happening. I want you to avoid that. I want you to not have that. The Greek word translated for sincere here means to not have any falsehood. Just be you. Genuinely you. Take the plasticness off and get rid of it. Be genuine. Be sincere from the heart. Paul prayed for them to have mature Christian love and character without offense until the day of Christ. Our lives are not to cause other people to stumble. Our lives as believers is not to cause another believer to stumble. Are we not all walking the same direction? Is the road not bumpy enough all by itself? Is the road not already something that we have to navigate potholes? We have to navigate stuff. We have to navigate the robbers on the road. Why would you want to take another believer walking the same direction you are and try to trip them? You wouldn't, but you do. Because he says, I want you to invest in them. I want you to help them. I want you to encourage them. As a matter of fact, I also, not only are we not supposed to make them stumble, I want to make sure that w you did everything you possibly could to get them prepared to stand at that Bema seat. Oh, you're saved. Your home is in heaven. You cannot lose your salvation. But there's a Bema seat that all of us believers will be standing at. And it says that all of our works done from the time we got saved on will be judged, both good and bad. <clears throat> Wouldn't you want to help that person not only not trip them, that's a negative, but how about a positive? Help them to get prepared for that test? If you were really good at math and you knew there was a math test coming up for somebody and you were trying to help them, you'd help them in math. Why can't we help everybody so that we're growing towards Christ? This is the feeding each other that was at the end of Matthew 24 we talked about. We need to be helping and feeding the other servants. Here is two good tests for us to follow as we exercise spiritual discernment. Does it make other people stumble? And will I be ashamed if Jesus is going to return? There's a sign of maturity. If your actions are constantly being tested by those two things. Paul also prayed that they might have a mature Christian service. Verse 11 said that he wanted them to be filled and fruitful. That does not mean church activities. I don't care how many groups you're on. I don't care what you do. I don't care if you polish the windows. We have spiritual fruit that is produced when we're in fellowship with Christ. When we're actually in fellowship, when we're in oneness with him. John 15, 4 said, Jesus is talking, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you 
unless you abide in me. The fellowship I'm talking about is abiding in Christ. The fellowship I'm talking about is where we're one with him, is where we're fellowshipping with him. And by doing so, we're fellowshipping with each other. Be in fellowship with Christ and allow his life to produce the fruit. Winning souls to Christ is bearing fruit. Do you know anybody that is a believer, but they've been struggling? Religion has just jacked them up in some fashion or another. And you go, man, but, but I know that it's different. Then tell them. Well, uh, that girl or that guy, you know, they just need to really, you know, get around some people that are serious. We meet on Sundays. We meet on Wednesdays. We meet on Thursdays. We can do everything except be you. Winning souls, bringing people in is bearing fruit. Holiness in our lives is spiritual fruit. How about our praise? Hebrews uh, 13, 15. Our praise is the fruit of our lips, it says. We were bearing fruit this morning, weren't we? We were bearing fruit right out of us. We were just bearing fruit. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So, this is Christian fellowship. Having in common, that's something that is eternal. Okay? It's much deeper than just friendship. I have you in my mind. I have you in my heart. I have you in my prayers to the Father. This is the kind of fellowship that produces joy. This is the single mind that produces the kind of fellowship that God's talking about. Real fellowship. Oneness fellowship. While we all stand up, we'll close up. <laughs> we hope that God spoke to you through this message. Our goal at Refuge Church is to assist in the growth of believers within the body of Christ. To leave a comment about this YouTube channel or for more information about Refuge Church, please visit our website at www.refuge-church.net. If you're in the Inland Empire area of Southern California, make plans to stop by and worship and study with us. We're located at 24711 Redlands Boulevard, Suite K in Loma Linda, California, 92354. Our men's Bible study is on Wednesday nights at 6.30. Our women's Bible study is on Thursday nights at 6.30. Our Sunday morning service begins at 10 a.m. and it's also video broadcast live on the web as well as our audio podcast. You can access these via our website. Thanks again for listening to Refuge Church.